Chapter twenty eight of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of all the strange experiences I have narrated in connection with Devlin, that which awaited me on the following morning was the most startling and inexplicable. Prevailing with difficulty upon Richard Carton to remain at the hotel until I either came to or sent for him, I drove to the foot of the Rue de la Paix, as I was instructed to do. I took the precaution to hire the driver of the fly by the hour, and desired him to stop where I alighted until I needed him. I was impelled to this course by a feeling that I might possibly require some person to take a message to Carton or bring him to the Rue de la Paix. I found the barber's shop easily, and could scarcely refrain from uttering a loud exclamation at the sight of Mr. Kenneth Dowsett sitting in a barber's chair, and Devlin standing over him, leisurely at work. Devlin, with his finger at his lips, pointed to a table in a corner of the shop, at which I seated myself in obedience to the silent command. On the table were writing materials and paper, and on a sheet of this paper was written, "'You are late.' I have thrown Mr. Dowsett into a trance. He will reveal all he knows. I will compel him to do so. Take down in writing what transpires. My heart throbbed violently as I prepared myself for the task. Devlin. Do you know where you are? Mr. Dowsett. Yes, in Bologna. Devlin. Where were you yesterday? Mr. Dowsett. In Margate. Devlin. Where were you on Friday last? Mr. Dowsett. At home, in London. Devlin. Recall the occurrences of that day? Mr. Dowsett. I do so. Devlin. At what hour did you rise? Mr. Dowsett. At nine o'clock. Devlin. Who were present at the breakfast table? Mr. Dowsett. My wife and daughter, and Richard Carton. Devlin. Was anything relating to the engagement of Richard Carton and Lizzie Melladew said at the breakfast table? Mr. Dowsett. Nothing. Devlin. Was there anything in your mind in relation to it? Mr. Dowsett. Yes. I had a plan to carry out, and was thinking of it. Devlin. In what way did you put the plan into execution? Mr. Dowsett. When breakfast was over, I went to my private room and locked the door. Then I sat down and wrote a letter. Devlin. To whom? Mr. Dowsett. To Lizzie Melladew. Devlin. What did you write? Mr. Dowsett. A heartbroken woman implores you to meet her to-night at eleven o'clock in Victoria Park, and, so that she may recognize you, begs you to wear a bunch of white daisies in your belt. She will wear the same, so that you may recognize her. The life and welfare of Mr. Richard Carton hangs upon this meeting. If you fail, a dreadful fate awaits him, which you can avert. As you value his happiness and your own, come. Devlin. What did you do with the letter? Mr. Dowsett. I addressed it to Miss Lizzie Melladew, at her place of business in Baker Street, and posted it at the Charing Cross Post Office. Devlin. How did you know she worked there? Mr. Dowsett. I learned it from my ward, Richard Carton. Devlin. Did you disguise your handwriting? Mr. Dowsett. Yes, I wrote it in a feminine hand. Devlin. What was your object in writing the letter? Mr. Dowsett. I was determined that Richard Carton should not marry Lizzie Melladew. Devlin. Why? Mr. Dowsett. I had all along arranged that he should marry my daughter, Letitia. Devlin. How did you propose to break off the match between your ward and Lizzie Melladew? Mr. Dowsett. My plans were not entirely clear to myself. I intended to appeal to the young woman, and to invent some disreputable story to make her suspect that he was false to her. If that failed, then... Devlin. Proceed. Then... Mr. Dowsett. I was resolved to go to any lengths, to do anything to prevent the marriage. Devlin even murder. Mr. Dowsett. I did not think of that. I would not think of it. Devlin. But you did think of it. You could not banish that idea from your mind? Mr. Dowsett. I could not, though I tried. It crept in the whole of the day. I could not help seeing the scene, night, the park, 
the young woman with the bunch of white daisies in her belt, stained with blood. Devlin. Those pictures were in your mind, and you could not banish them? Mr. Dowsett. I could not. Devlin. There were other reasons for preventing the marriage than your wish that Richard Carton should marry your daughter? Mr. Dowsett. There were. Devlin. What were they? Mr. Dowsett. If he married Lizzie Melladew, I should no longer enjoy the income I had received for so many years. I looked upon it as mine. I could not live without it. We should have been beggared, disgraced as well. I had forged my ward's name to bills, and if he married out of my family there would have been exposure, and I might have found myself in a felon's dock. If he married my daughter this would not occur. I was safe so long as I could keep my hold upon him. Devlin. Did your wife and daughter know this? Mr. Dowsett. My daughter knew nothing of it. My wife suspected it. Devlin. Did she know that you contemplated murder? Mr. Dowsett. She did not. Devlin. Why did you give Richard Carton a sleeping draught on that night? Mr. Dowsett. In order that he might sleep soundly, and not discover that I left the house late. Devlin. Were your wife and daughter asleep when you left your house? Mr. Dowsett. They were abed. I do not know whether they were asleep. Devlin. You took a knife with you? Mr. Dowsett. I did. Devlin. Where did you obtain it? Mr. Dowsett. It was a large clasp knife I had had for years. I found it in a private drawer. Devlin. You went to the private drawer for the purpose of finding it? Mr. Dowsett. I did. Devlin. Did any one see you leave the house? Mr. Dowsett. No one. Devlin. Did you walk or ride to Victoria Park? Mr. Dowsett. I walked. Devlin. To avoid suspicion? Mr. Dowsett. Yes. Devlin. When you arrived at the park, did you have any difficulty in finding Miss Melladew? Mr. Dowsett. I soon found her. Devlin. What did you do then? Mr. Dowsett. I made an appeal to her. Devlin. Did she listen to you quietly? Mr. Dowsett. No. She taunted me with having tricked her by writing an anonymous letter in a disguised hand. Devlin. Go on. Mr. Dowsett. I told her that it was the only way I could obtain a private interview with her. I invented a scandalous story about my ward. She said she did not believe it and that she would expose me to him. She told me that I was infamous, and that it was her belief I had been systematically practising deceit upon my ward, and that she would not be surprised to discover that I had been robbing him. "'Tomorrow he shall see you in your true colours,' she said. I was maddened. If she carried out her intention, I knew that I was a ruined and disgraced man. "'That tomorrow will never come,' I cried. The knife was in my hand. I scarcely know how it came there, and do not remember opening the blade. "'That to-morrow will come,' she retorted. "'It shall not,' I cried, and I stabbed her to the heart. She uttered but one cry, and fell down dead. "'Devlin. What did you do after that?' "'Mr. Dowsett. I hastened away, taking the knife with me. I chose the darkest paths. Suddenly I came upon a young woman, sitting upon a bench, reclining against the back. I saw her face, and was rooted to the spot in sudden fear. She did not stir. Recovering, I crept softly towards her, and found that she was asleep. Leaving her there, I hastened back to the woman I had stabbed. I knelt down and looked closely at her. I felt in her pockets. She was quite dead. There were letters in her pockets which I examined. And then, and then, Devlin, and then? Mr. Dowsett. I discovered that the woman I had killed was not Lizzie Melladew. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. So startled was I by this revelation that I jumped to my feet in a state of uncontrollable agitation. What I should have done I cannot say, 
but the direction of events was not left in my hands. Simultaneously with my movement of astonishment a piercing scream rang through the house. I was standing now by the chair in which Mr. Kenneth Dowsett was sitting in his trance, and I observed a change pass over his face. The scream had pierced the veil in which his waking senses were enshrouded. Devlin also observed this change, and he said to me hurriedly, "'Go upstairs and see what is taking place. Your presence may be needed there, and to one person may be very welcome. I will keep charge over this man.' As I left the room, I heard Devlin turn the key in the lock. Rapidly I mounted the stairs, and dashed into a room on the first landing, from which the sound of female voices were issuing. Three women were there, two were strangers to me, but even in that agitating moment I correctly divined that they were Mrs. Dowsett and Letitia. The third, who rushed with convulsive sobs into my open arms, was no other than Lizzie Melladew herself. "'Oh, thank God you have come!' she sobbed. "'Thank God! Thank God! Where is Mary? Where is Richard? Take me to them! Oh, take me to them!' Mrs. Dowsett was the first to recover herself. "'You will remain here,' she said sternly to Lizzie, and then, addressing me, "'How dare you break into my apartment in this manner?' "'I dare do more than that,' I replied, in a voice sterner than her own and holding the weeping girl close to my heart, "'Prepare you to answer for what has been done. I thank God, indeed, that I have arrived in time, perhaps to prevent another crime. All is discovered.' At these words Mrs. Dowsett shrank back, white and trembling. I did not stop to say more. My first duty was to place Lizzie Melladew in safety. But where? The mental question conveyed its own answer. Where, but in her lover's arms? Come, I said to Lizzie, you are safe now. I am going to take you to Richard Carton. Trust yourself to me. I will, I will, sobbed Lizzie. Richard is here, then? How thankful I am, how thankful! And Mary, my dear sister, is she here, too? I was appalled at this last question. It proved that Lizzie was ignorant of what had occurred. Not daring to answer her, I drew her from the room, and the women I left there made no attempt to prevent me. Swiftly I took my precious charge from the house, and in a very few minutes we were in the carriage which was waiting for me at the foot of the Rue de la Paix. The driver understood the direction I gave him, and we galloped at full speed to the Hôtel de Poilly. Without revealing to Lizzie what I knew, I learnt from her before we reached the hotel sufficient to enlighten me as to Mr. Kenneth Dowsett's proceedings, and to confirm my suspicion that it was Mary Melladew who had met her death at that villain's hands. When Lizzie received the anonymous letter which he wrote to her, she took it to her poor sister, who, fearing some plot, prevailed upon her to let her see the anonymous writer in Lizzie's place, and the better to carry out the plan, the sisters changed dresses, and went together to Victoria Park. Being twins, and bearing so close a resemblance to each other, there was little fear of the change being discovered until at least Mary had ascertained why the meeting was so urgently desired. Leaving Lizzie in a secluded part of the park, Mary proceeded to the rendezvous, with what result Mr. Dowsett's confession had already made clear. Discovering the fatal error he had committed, Mr. Dowsett returned to Lizzie, who, while waiting for her sister, had fallen asleep. Being thoroughly unnerved, he decided that there was only one means of safety before him, flight and the concealment of Lizzie Melladew. The idea of a second murder may have occurred to him, but, villain as he was, he had not the courage to carry it out. He had taken from the dead girl's pocket everything it contained, with the exception of a handkerchief which, in his haste, he overlooked and upon this handkerchief was marked the name of Lizzie Melladew. He could imitate Richard Carton's writing, as was proved by the forgeries he had already committed, and upon the back of this anonymous letter he wrote in pencil a few words in which Lizzie was implored to trust herself implicitly to Mr. Dowsett, and without question to do as he directed. Signing these words in Richard Carton's name, he awoke Lizzie and gave her the note. Alarmed and agitated as the young girl was, and fearing that some great danger threatened her lover, 
she with very little hesitation allowed herself to be persuaded by mr dowsett and accompanied him home where is mary she asked with our dear richard replied mr dowsett we shall see them to-morrow when all will be explained at home mr dowsett informed his wife of his peril and the three females left for margate by an early train in the morning in margate mrs dowsett received telegrams signed richard carton but really sent by her husband, which she showed to Lizzie, and which served in some measure to assist the successful continuation of the scheme by which Lizzie was to be taken out of the country. Meanwhile she was in absolute ignorance of her sister's fate. No newspaper was allowed to reach her hands, nor was she allowed to speak to a soul but Mrs. Dowsett and Letitia. What was eventually to be done with her I cannot say. Probably Mr. Dowsett himself had not been able to make up his mind which was almost entirely occupied by considerations for his own safety. I did not, of course, learn all this from Lizzie, she being then ignorant of much which I have related, but I have put together what she told me, and what I subsequently learnt from Devlin and other sources. Arriving at the Hôtel de Poilly, I succeeded in conveying Lizzie into a private room, and then I sought Richard Carton. I need not set down here in detail the conversation I had with him. Little by little I made him acquainted with the whole truth. Needless to describe his joy when he heard that his beloved girl was alive and safe, joy tempered with grief at poor Mary's fate. When he was calm enough to be practical, he asked me what was to be done. "'No time must be lost,' I said, in restoring your dear Lizzie to her parents. To you I shall confide her.' leave that monster, your treacherous guardian, to Devlin and me. It was with difficulty I restrained him from rushing to Lizzie, but I insisted that his movements must be definitely decided upon before he saw her. I called in the assistance of the jolly landlady, and she supplied me with a timetable, from which I ascertained that a boat for Dover left at 12.31, and that it was timed to reach its destination at 3.20. There were numerous trains from Dover to London, and Lizzie would be in her parents' arms before night. Carton joyfully acquiesced in this arrangement, and then I took him to his dear girl, and, closing the door upon them, left them to themselves. A meeting such as theirs, and under such circumstances, was sacred. While they were together, I wrote two letters, one to my wife, and the other to Mr. Portland, which I intended should be delivered by Carton. I did not intrude upon the happy lovers till the last moment. I found them sitting close together, quite silent, hand clasped in hand, her head upon his breast. I had cautioned him to say nothing of Mary's sad fate, and I saw by the expression upon Lizzie's face that he had obeyed me. After joy would come sorrow. There was time enough for that. Mary had given her life for her sisters. The sacrifice would ever be in sacred remembrance. I saw them off by the boat, they waved their handkerchiefs to me, and I thought of the Melodews mourning at home, to whom, at least, one dear child would soon be restored. When the boat was out of sight, I jumped into the carriage, and was driven back to the Rue de la Paix. End of chapter 29「Chapter thirty of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I tried the door of the room in which I had left Devlin and Mr. Kenneth Dowsett. It was locked. Enter, said Devlin, unlocking the door. They were both in the room, Devlin smiling and unruffled, Mr. Dowsett in the full possession of his senses and terribly ill at ease. He turned like death when he saw me. "'This gentleman,' said Devlin, "'is angry at being detained by me, and would have resorted to violence if he thought it would serve his purpose. I have waited for your return to decide what to do.' "'You shall pay for this,' Mr. Dowsett managed to say. "'You and your confederate. If there is justice in this world, I will make you smart for your unlawful proceedings.' "'There is justice in the world,' I said calmly as you shall find he was silent with a weight of guilt upon his soul he did not know how to reply to this remark but he managed presently to ask 
how long do you intend to detain me you shall know soon i said and by a gesture i intimated to devlin that i wished to confer with him alone he accompanied me from the room and we stood in the passage keeping guard upon the door which devlin locked from the outside there are no means of escape from within he said i have seen to that in a low tone i told him what i had done and he approved the question now is i said what step are we next to take there lies the difficulty replied devlin you see my dear sir we have no evidence upon which to arrest him no evidence i cried is there not his own confession of guilt devlin shook his head spiritual evidence only my dear sir not admissible in any court of law in the world impossible to obtain his arrest in a foreign country upon such a slender thread he might bring the same accusation against us and we might all be thrown into jail and kept there for months this is not what i bargained for our best plan will be to get him back to england then you can take some practicable step but how to manage that i asked it can be managed i think said devlin i have a scheme he knows nothing of the confession he has made lizzie melladew's name has not been mentioned between us it is only his fears and my strength of will that make him tractable before i put my scheme into operation go upstairs to see if his wife and daughter are in the house i have my suspicions that they have flown you will find me here when you come down i ran upstairs to the apartments occupied by mrs dowsett devlin's suspicions were confirmed the two women were gone there were evidences around of a hasty flight the most pregnant of them being a small box which had been broken open i judged immediately that this was the box which had contained the two thousand sovereigns and indeed i found two of the sovereigns under a couch whither they had rolled while the bulk was being taken out the conclusion i came to was that the women frightened that all was discovered as i had informed them had broken open the box and packed the gold away upon their persons had taken to flight leaving mr dowsett to his fate i went down to devlin and acquainted him with the result of my investigation quite as i expected he said let them go for the present our concern is with the man inside i am going to put my scheme into operation what is the time five minutes past two i replied looking at my watch in capital time said devlin wait you here until half past two then go in to mr dowsett and apologize to him for the indignity to which he has been subjected he will fume and threaten let him be you humble and contrite and say that you are very very sorry throw all the blame upon me say that i have deceived you imposed upon you robbed you anything that comes to your mind to me it matters not it will assist our scheme there is no fear of mr dowsett not waiting till you go in to him he is frightened out of his life your humble attitude will give him courage he will think himself safe i cannot imagine i said how this will help us don't imagine said devlin curtly leave it to me the first thing mr dowsett will do when he finds himself free will be to go up to the rooms in which he left the three women who accompanied him here meanwhile you will keep watch outside the house but on no account must he see you trust to me for the rest he had served me so faithfully up to this point that i trusted him unhesitatingly as he had prophesied mr dowsett kept quiet within the room listening at the door i heard him moving softly about but he made no attempt to come out at half past two i entered the room and followed devlin's instructions to the letter mr dowsett his courage restored immediately began to bluster and threaten i listened submissively and made pretence of being greatly distressed when he had exhausted himself i left him with further profuse expressions of regret and as i issued from the house i saw him mounting the stairs to his wife's apartments emerging into the rue de la paix i planted myself in a spot upon which i had a clear view of the house and was myself concealed from observation scarcely was i settled in my position when i saw a man with a telegram in his hand enter the house he remained there a very few moments and then came out and walked away having presumably delivered his message 
within a space of five minutes mr dowsett holding the telegram came forth and casting sharp glances around quickly left the rue de la paix before he had turned the corner devlin joined me humming a french song together we followed mr dowsett at a safe distance my scheme is alive he said i asked him to explain it to me you saw the messenger he said enter with a telegram you saw him leave without it you saw mr dowsett come out with the telegram it was from his wife from his wife sent by me the telegram was to the effect that something had occurred which had induced her to leave boulogne immediately and that she her daughter and the young lady with them i was careful not to mention her name you see would be in ramsgate waiting for him he was to come by the afternoon boat and she would meet him on the pier see he is entering the shipping office now to secure his passage what are we to do we travel in the same boat going aboard at the last moment after the boat has started not before he will know that we are fellow passengers all happened as devlin had arranged by his skilful pioneering we did not lose sight of mr dowsett until he stepped aboard the boat and i inferred from his manner that by that time he had regained confidence and deemed his secret safe when we slipped on deck at the very moment of starting mr dowsett was below in the saloon there were not many passengers and the french coast was still in view when mr dowsett came up from the saloon and stood by the bulwarks within a yard or two of the seat upon which we were sitting we did not speak but sat watching him turning he saw us you here he cried by your leave i replied not by my leave he said why are you following me have you any reason i said for suspecting that you are being followed i was a fool to ask the question he said turning abruptly away i did not speak but kept my eyes upon him i was determined not to lose sight of him for another moment some understanding of this determination seemed to dawn upon him he looked at me two or three times with wavering eyes and presently summoning all his courage to his aid he stared me full in the face i met his gaze sternly unflinchingly until i compelled him to lower his eyes then he suddenly went down into the saloon i stepped swiftly after him and devlin accompanied me for the purpose of testing me he turned and ascended again to the deck we followed him perhaps he said you will explain what you mean by this conduct what need to ask i replied let your conscience answer it is an outrage he said after a pause if you continue to annoy me i shall appeal to the captain do so i said and prepare to meet at once the charge i shall bring against you he did not dare to inquire the nature of the charge he did not dare to move or speak again sullenly and with an inward raging the traces of which he could not disguise he remained by the bulwarks staring down at the water suddenly there was a lull aboard the machinery stopped working some accident said devlin and went to ascertain its nature returning he said we shall be delayed a couple of hours most likely it will be dark night when we arrive it was as he said for two hours or more we made no progress then the necessary repairs having been made we started again by that time it was evening and still mr dowsett neither moved nor spoke night crept on there was no moon and not a star visible in the dark sky it was black night mr dowsett strove to take advantage of this to evade and escape from us but we kept so close to him that we could have touched him by the movement of a finger where he glided we glided and still he uttered not a word we stood in a group alone isolated as it were from the other passengers after repeated attempts to slip from us mr dowsett remained still again in the midst of the darkness devlin's voice stole upon our ears short-sighted fool he said to think that crime can be forever successfully hidden wherever man moves the spirit of committed evil accompanies him and leads him to his doom 
his peril lies not only in mortal insight but in the unseen mysterious agencies by which he is surrounded blood for blood it is the immutable law and if by some human failure he for a time evades his punishment at the hand of man he suffers a punishment more terrible than human justice can execute upon him waking or sleeping it is ever with him look out upon the darkness and behold rising from the shadows the form of the innocent girl whose life you took to the last moment of your life her spirit shall accompany you till death claims you you shall know no peace whatever of malignancy there was in devlin's voice the words he spoke conveyed the stern eternal truth it seemed to me as i gazed before me that the spirit he evoked loomed sadly among the shadows onward through the sea the boat ploughed its way and we three stood close together encompassed by a dread and awful silence for devlin spoke no more nor from mr dowsett's lips did any sound issue in the distance we saw the lights of ramsgate pier and before the captain or any person on board was aware of its close contiguity we suddenly dashed against it i and all others on board were thrown violently down by the shock there were loud cries of alarm and agony and i found myself separated from my companions from the water came appeals for help from some who had been tossed overboard by the collision and a period of great confusion ensued what help could be given was afforded and when i succeeded in reaching the stone pier in safety i heard that a few of the passengers were missing among them devlin and mr dowsett i remained on the pier till past one o'clock in the morning rendering what little assistance i could and eventually i learned that all who had been in danger were saved with the exception of the two whom i have named it was early morning before the body of one was recovered that one was mr kenneth dowsett he lay dead in a boat his face convulsed with agony upturned to the grey light of the coming day of devlin no trace could be found there is but little more to tell with the exception of the part which devlin played in it and which has now for the first time been related the story became public property and kenneth dowsett was proved to be the murderer of poor mary melladew time has softened the grief of mr and mrs melladew and they find in the love of lizzie and her husband richard carton some solace for the tragedy which a ruthless hand committed mr portland paid me the two thousand pounds he promised and i am in a fair way of business fanny lemon and her husband live in retirement in the country not a word ever passes their lips in connection with the events i have related i have seen and heard nothing of mrs dowsett and her daughter a short time ago my wife and i were in an open-air public place of amusement witnessing a wonderful exhibition the extraordinary novelty of which consisted in a man floating earthwards from the clouds at a distance of some thousands of feet from the earth look there said my wife i had given her such faithful and vivid descriptions of devlin that she always said if it happened that he still lived and she saw him that she could not fail to recognize him i turned in the direction she indicated and standing alone apart from the crowd once more saw devlin he was watching the performer floating from heaven to earth there was a strange smile upon his lips i could not restrain the impulse which prompted me to move towards him my approach attracted his attention he looked at me and was gone i have never seen him since the last words i heard him speak recur to me there was in them the spirit of divine justice crimes cannot be for ever successfully hidden the monsters who commit them shall be brought to their doom by those whose duty it is to track them down or by unseen mysterious agencies by which they are surrounded or by their own confession but let the legislators see to it let those who call themselves philanthropists and humanitarians see to it let those whose fortune it is to possess great wealth see to it there are in this modern babylon fester spots of corruption wherein nothing but sin and vice can possibly grow they are crowded with human beings ripened for evil they are crowded with human souls lost to salvation they are an infamy 
and the infamy rests not upon the creatures who are born and bred there, but upon those who allow them to be, and who have the undoubted power to cleanse them, and make them healthy for body and soul. For generation upon generation have they been allowed to breed corruption. To this day they are allowed to do so. All who have the remedy in their hands are responsible. The preacher who preaches and does not practice, the rich who can afford but grudges to give, the statesman with his dilettante efforts toward social improvement and his huge efforts toward place and power, one and all of these are accountable for the sin. It is no less, and it rests upon them. Footnote. I have this desk with its contents now in my possession. The extraordinary revelations made therein, which I may mention have no connection with the present story, will one day be made public. B. L. F. End of chapter 30 End of Devlin the Barber by B. L. Fargin Recording by Lee Smalley